Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this long and comprehensive history of Thanksgiving slash Thanksgiving dinner. Before we go into the actual history of Thanksgiving, we'll go into full length and detail on the history of Thanksgiving dinner. In this video, I will specify chapter after chapter and give you the timeline to help you go to the chapter you want to go. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, and before we begin, I want to lay out the chapters of the history of Thanksgiving dinner and Thanksgiving itself. If you want to see the chapters, either go to the description box down below or look for the numbers on the screen. For Thanksgiving dinner, number one, calories. Number two, consumption statistics slash turkey and ham stats. Three, Thanksgiving waste statistics, number four, roast preparation time slash dinner preparation time, and finally number five, conclusion of Thanksgiving dinner history lesson. After this, the history of Thanksgiving lesson can begin. Number one, the first Thanksgiving dinner and after the Revolutionary War, 1621 to 1789. Number two, November 26th, 1863. Lincoln announces the holiday for celebration. Number three, the first Thanksgiving in Canada. Number four, the Thanksgiving holiday bill of 1941. Number five, the Great Cranberry Scare of 1959. And finally, present day, post-1959 to present day. Without further ado, let's begin and dig in. There is no possible way to accurately calculate the calories of the first Thanksgiving feast in 1621. Because in a study we're about to read, it wasn't until centuries later. Here's a study published by James L. Hargrove called History of the Calorie in Nutrition, which was published on December 1st, 2006. It originally came from the Journal of Nutrition, Volume 136, Issue 12, December of 2006, pages 2,957 to 2,961. Let's let David do Dickley do the job, and it's going to be an extensive one, so bear with me. I'm doing this to go easy on my throat, because I'm going through seasonal changes already. Let's get into this, shall we? Abstract. The calorie was not a unit of heat in the original metric system. Some histories state that a defined calorie, modern KCAL, originated with Favre and Silberman in 1852 or Meyer in 1848. However, Nicholas Clement introduced calories in lectures on heat engines that were given in Paris between 1819 and 1824. The calorie was already defined in Becherel's 1845 Dictionnaire National. In 1863, the word entered the English language through translation of Gannot's popular French physics text, which defined a calorie as the heat needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water from zero to one degree Celsius. Berthelot distinguished between G and KG calories by 1879, and Raymond used the KCAL in a discussion of human energy needs in an 1894 medical physiology text. The capitalized calorie as used to indicate one kilocalorie on U.S. food labels derives from Atwater's 1887 article on food energy in Century Magazine and Farmer's Bulletin 23 in 1894. Formal recognition began in 1896 when the G-calorie was defined as a secondary unit of energy in the CMGS measurement system. The thermal calorie was not fully defined until the 20th century, by which time the nutritional calorie was embedded in U.S. popular culture and nutritional policy. The thermal units of G-calorie, 4.184 joules, and KG-calorie, KCAL or capitalized calorie, 4.184 kilojoules, calorie is capitalized when the original text refers to a KG-calorie, the lower case word denotes a G-calorie, are so familiar in nutrition that one tends not to ask when they were first defined or how they entered common usage. The hypothesis of this paper is that the French word, calorie, had been coined and defined by 1824 and was originally used in the sense of a zero, one degree CK cal. The dictionnaire de l'Académie me franc eyes lists. Calorie non féminin 19e siècle. If so, this contradicts the statement that Lavoisier served on the committee that developed the Centimetrogram Second Measurement System, CGS, which defined the calorie used today. 
There is no documentation that the original metric commission defined a unit of heat. If Lavoisier's work is too early, other attributions of 1848 to 53 are clearly too late, because the calorie had already been defined in the 1845 edition of Becherel's Dictionary of the French Language. In addition to its technical usage by scientists, the word calorie entered the popular vocabulary across Europe and the United States by the late 19th century. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary cites E. Atkinson's 1863 translation of Adolf Gannot's French physics text as the first occurrence of the calorie in English. However, this physics text is not the source for the calorie of nutrition. This article will outline the early usage and spread of the calorie as a heat unit from France to other countries during the 19th century. Origin and usage of the calorie in France. The word calorie as a unit of heat seems to have been coined sometime between 1787 and 1824. Lavoisier studied specific heats of water and other materials and conducted some of the earliest experiments involving direct and indirect calorimetry. He named the calorimeter, calorimetre, by 1789. Although Lavoisier was credited with coining oxygen and many new chemical terms, he did not include the calorie on his list of new words. Lavoisier's papers refer to calorique, caloric, angela, heat, but not to the calorie as a thermal unit. At that time, caloric was regarded as a substance rather than a unit of heat. Lavoisier served on the 1791 Commission on Weights and Measures of the French Academy of Science and helped define the kilogram. A strict definition of the calorie would require metric units and Lavoisier used a quantity called the lever, about a pound, rather than the kilogram. He was executed by French revolutionaries in 1794 before the metric system was officially adopted in 1799. The original metric system of 1795 to 9 defined the base units for length, area, volume, capacity, weight, not mass, and money along with various prefixes. It was intended as a means of simplifying trade and did not include derived scientific units for energy, electricity, or magnetism. These secondary units were not defined until after the metric convention of 1875, when the Bureau International de Poids et Misuries, BIPM, was formed. Several histories attribute the first usage of the calorie to sources that are too late. For example, Taton indicates that Favre and Silverman coined the term in 1852. Others also credit Favre for defining the calorie. However, the original publication states that the calorie was a well-known unit of physics, digital copies of L. N. Becherel's Dictionnaire National, Adolf Gannot's Trait Element Air de Physiques, and the original text from Favre and Silverman's article on thermochemistry are available at the Gallica Internet site. Prior histories of the calorie in nutrition do not discuss the origin of the calorie or kcal as units of heat. This article will show that use of the calorie as a defined unit of heat developed concurrently with the metric system but not as a recognized metric unit and dates to work in chemistry or engineering no later than 1819 to 1824. A timeline of some key events is shown in figure 1. It is hard to assign priority to workers who state, we repeat that the unit that we adopted is that adopted by all the physicists. This is confirmed in the 1855 version, 4th edition, of Gannot's basic physics text. This text comes because Gannot defines the calorie, not capitalized, as a 0, 1 degree ckcal in relation to the heating of water without providing a reference, it seems evident that the calorie was well known. A French etymological dictionary lists the first occurrence of calorie as the 1842 to 3 volumes of Becherel's Dictionnaire National. The listing in the 1845 edition defines the calorie as physics. Quantite de chaleur en nécessaire pour élever un kilogramme. Do un degré du thermomètre centigrade. The definition is similar to Gannot's more precise usage. Furthermore, the Dictionnaire Historique de la Langue Francaise states that the word calorie was coined about 1819 to 24 and usage had become widespread by 1845. Thus, French sources do not indicate that Lavoisier defined the calorie. By 1824, the word calorie was being used as a unit of heat. In 1819, Nicolas Clément began giving lectures on the theory of heat and steam engines at the Conservatoire d'Arts et Métiers in Paris.
Clement was regarded as an industrial chemist or chemical engineer. Among the students was Sidi Carno and class notes are available that were taken by L. B. Franker and J. M. Baudot. Both Clement and Carno subscribed to the caloric hypothesis, which stated that heat behaved as a material substance and that its total amount was always conserved. The notes show that Clement defined a large, grande, and small, petite, calorie by 1823 to 4. A definition is written in Baudot's notes of December 23, 1824 contains a modern definition. Assuming that the mass abbreviation refers to a kg, this defines a modern kilocalorie. Clement sometimes referred to a grande calorie as the heat needed to melt a kg of ice, which is 334 kilojoules slash kilogram. This is different usage from the modern kcal, but the passage indicates that the calorie was known to engineers by this time. Method suggests that Clement may have coined the word calorie around 1820 but agrees that this is not certain, because Clement did not publish the definition. Other than the handwritten course notes, the first published use of the calorie was probably in 1825 in an anonymous description of Clement's course in a local journal called Producteur. Carnot used Clement's definition of heat units but not the name calorie in reflex ions on the motive power of fire. Other engineers began using the calorie by 1829, but the word apparently did not enter physics texts until much later. It is true that some scientists used heat units that would now be called g-calories in the 1850s. However, it was not until 1877-9 that Marcelin Berthelot stated that the large calorie equaled 1000 small 0, 1 degree C G calories and distinguished between them by capitalizing the abbreviation for the large calorie. Although Metod states that the KCAL was not introduced until 1935, it was used in the context of daily energy expenditure in a U.S. medical physiology text from 1894. A 14.5 degrees Celsius KCAL was defined in German law in 1924. It is not certain who first named the KCAL, the metric system in France. Nous répétons que l'unité que nous avons adoptée est celle adoptée par tous les physiciens, physicistes, c'est-à-dire la quantité de chaleur nécessaire pour élever un gramme d'eau de 1 degré, et que l'on appelle unité de chaleur ou calorie. From 1795 to 9, a committee of the Academy de Sciences sought to define the meter as a unit of length related to an arc of the Earth's circumference. The calorie could not be strictly defined without knowing the mass of water contained in a liter, which was based on a 10 centimeters cube. It is germane that the law of 1795 defined the G as the absolute weight of a volume of pure water contained in a cube one hundredth of a meter on a side at the temperature of melting ice. This is important because the G calorie eventually became a practical unit of heat, and the specific heat and mass of a volume of water depend on its temperature. Because the kg, g, m, and cm were all defined from the start, it is ambiguous whether the original metric system should be called mkgs or cmgs. However, the kg was considered to be the base unit of weight in the 1795 metric system. This is because the charge to the commission was to define standards for weights and measures used in commerce, and scientific concerns were secondary. Note that the original definition specified a weight rather than a mass, meaning that the original kg was defined as kg force, similarly to a pound. Not until 1904 was the newton defined as a unit of force so that the kg became a mass unit. Because the g was not considered to be a base unit in the metric system when the calorie was defined, there was no need to add the kilo prefix. The definition of a calorie as the heat needed to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of water by 1 degree Celsius was the original usage and the kcal as 103 g calories was not introduced until sometime between 1877 and 1894. Indeed, the thermal g calorie was not defined as 4.184 joules until 1902 and it was a 17 degrees Celsius, not 15 degrees Celsius, unit. The original metric system was short-lived as a French national standard. In 1812, Napoleon Bonaparte issued a decree to establish a usual system that changed metric values to conform to earlier weights and measures. Not until 1840 was a law passed to reinstate a metric system based on scientific standards. During this same period, European interest in thermodynamics, fuels, and electricity was high. Indeed, 
One of the reasons that Jarl began his experiments on heat was a desire to reduce the cost of running equipment in the family brewery. Metric advocates worldwide recognized the simplicity of basing units of measure on the decimal system, and the metric system was promoted at World Expositions in London, 1851, and Paris, 1867. Also in 1867, the International Geodetic Association formed a committee to investigate the use of the metric system in scientific measurements. The system was made legal for commerce in Britain, 1864, and the United States, 1866, and became compulsory in Germany, 1868. The International Metric Convention of 1875 gave scientists impetus to define accurate standards in electricity, magnetism, and thermodynamics. This led to the introduction of the CGS in 1896 in which the ERG, DINE, and JARL were defined. In 1918, the Newton was added as a unit of force to the MKGS system and the JARL was defined as 1 nm of work. The ability to define the JARL unambiguously in base units, amp -S, led to its adoption as the SI, SISTME International, unit of energy. During the 1930s, the BIPM convened the Consultative Committee on Thermometry to clarify standards of heat and WH Keesum served as president. In addition to reviewing the history of the calorie, Keesum summarized a proposal that the calorie should equal 1 slash 860 watt hours or 3600 slash 860 joules 4.186 J. From then on, any secondary thermal unit was to be defined relative to the joule rather than to the heating of water at any temperature. The 1948 General Conference also recommended discarding the calorie because it cannot be derived directly from basic units. In 1954, the SI base units were adopted, and in 1970, the Committee on Nomenclature of the American Institute of Nutrition advised that the kilocalorie should be replaced by the kilojoule KJ, in scientific publications. The calorie in German physiology. The calorie probably entered U.S. English because W.O. Atwater learned the term during studies in Germany, and not because it was defined in a newly translated physics text. Justice Liebig did not mention the calorie as such in his 1842 book on animal chemistry, or his paper on energy production from foodstuffs. However, he published J.R. Mayer's first scientific paper, which defined a mechanical equivalent of heat. Meyer self-published two intriguing papers that dealt partly with the efficiency of energy metabolism, which he estimated to be 15 to 20 percent. It was in the context of relating physical work against gravity, fallcraft or potential energy, to the energy supplied by foods that Meyer defined a kg cal in 1846 to 8, as translated by Lindsay, the quotation is, when substances endowed with considerable chemical affinity for each other combine chemically, much heat is developed during the process. We shall estimate the quantity of heat thus set free by the number of kilograms of water which it would heat 1 degree Celsius. The quantity of heat necessary to raise 1 kilogram of water 1 degree is called a unit of heat, calorie. The German text reads in part. Die Wärmemenge nennt man Wärmeeinheit, Kalorie. Note that Mayer's definition, which occurred 48 years before the Joule was introduced as a unit of energy, is essentially identical to the calorie that is still used on U.S. food labels. The calorie began to enter popular American vocabulary after Atwater explained the unit in his 1887 article in Century magazine. The most important avenue was probably the USDA Farmers Bulletins, which provided the first U.S. food databases to be used in dietetics. Then, as now, American audiences were interested in managing weight, and the calorie was soon introduced in articles and books. For example, Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters' best-selling Diet and Health with Key to the Calories specifically cited Farmers Bulletin as a source of information. Eventually, the calorie was adopted for the nutrition facts panels on U.S. food labels. At present, there does not seem to be a movement by policymakers in the U.S. to replace the calorie with the KJ on nutrition information panels. JLH thanks Dr. Patrick Rei Denbaugh, University of Georgia Libraries, the staff of the BIPM, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and the Library of Congress for Bibliographic Assistance. Thanks also to Pat Naughton of Geelong, Australia, for correspondence about the history of the calorie. 
In America, the calorie wasn't implemented and introduced as a measurable unit on all food products until 1973. Now let's calculate the amount of calories in the average Thanksgiving dinner plate, mainly referencing the American Farm Bureau Federation's menu not adjusted for inflation price-wise. According to the AFBF, and Statista in the supplementary notes of that said statistical graph. It says, the sources notes, the shopping list for Farm Bureau's informal survey includes turkey, stuffing, sweet potatoes, rolls with butter, peas, cranberries, a veggie tray, pumpkin pie with whipped cream, and coffee and milk. All in quantities sufficient to serve a family of 10 with plenty for leftovers. So if a 16 pound turkey feeds about 10 people and the amount of calories in one pound of turkey whole roasted is 862 calories, you multiply that by 1.6, which is the average serving of turkey in pounds per person, then you'll get 1,379 calories of turkey per person, according to the AFBF. And finally adding everything else, they described in that entire menu that has been left unchanged since 1986, then you'll get a total of 2,725 calories for the average American, according to the AFBF, referencing their menu. Now let's move on to the next major Thanksgiving dinner segment to analyze the history of consumption stats slash turkey and ham stats. Here we go. There are no consumption stats for 1621, but we'll get to the first Thanksgiving dinner in the history of Thanksgiving itself section begins after this giant first one. Before we go into statistics, let's get into the history of Thanksgiving dinner during and after the Civil War. According to the Library of Congress, in a blog, Sarah Joseph Bale was the same one who originally posted recipes for creating the perfect dinner of turkey, oysters, potatoes, macaroni, chicken pot pie, cranberries, and pie. And let David do Dickley do the rest. From Civil War diaries we know what the troops ate generally and on special occasions. For holidays, various organizations solicited donations of food including poultry, mince pies, sausages, and fruit. One account notes that the Sanitary Commission put on a feed in the field that consisted of turkey, chicken, and apples but a day late. A soldier noted, it isn't the turkey, but the idea that we care for. In the University of Iowa's collections of Civil War diaries and letters, Asa Bean, a surgeon in the Union Army, wrote describing his Thanksgiving dinner on November 27, 1862. And I quote, There has been a surprise party here today for the benefit of soldiers and nurses they were furnished with a Thanksgiving dinner roast turkey, chicken and pigeon and oysters stewed. I had a good dinner of baked chicken and pudding boiled potatoes, turnip, apple butter, cheese butter, tea and trimmings, we live well enough, but cannot eat much without being sick. The Confederate soldiers' rations consisted of cornbread, mule meat, or a meat substitute of rice and molasses. There are reports of men existing for days on handfuls of parched corn or field peas. Kush or slosh a dish of necessity was made by putting small pieces of beef in bacon grease, then pouring in water and stewing it. Next, cornbread was crumbled in it. And the mixture was stewed again until all the water was cooked out. Another dish combined Irish potatoes and green apples boiled together and mashed and seasoned with onions. Yet another dish, known as slapjack, consisted of a thick mixture of cornmeal or flour and fried in bacon grease until it was brown. The Union soldiers' rations were somewhat better. Salt pork, ham, beans, split peas, dried fruits, hard tack, and desiccated vegetables were on the list. The unpopular desiccated vegetables were often called desecrated vegetables. These were layers of cabbage leaves, 
turnip tops, sliced carrots, turnips, parsnips, and a few onions. They were dehydrated in large blocks in ovens and then cut into one ounce cubes. Issued to prevent scurvy, they were made into soup or fried. Other recipes used in the Union Army included ash cakes, cornmeal mixed with salt and water, wrapped in cabbage leaves and cooked in ashes until firm. Baked beans, baked in a kettle placed in a hold in the ground and then covered and banked with hot coals and allowed to cook overnight, sometimes salt pork added. Hard tack pudding, hard tack pounded into a powder, mixed with water and flour if available, then kneaded into dough, rolled out like a pie crust, and filled with apples or anything available. Finally it would be wrapped up in a cloth and boiled for an hour. Hellfire stew, hard tack boiled in water and bacon grease. Lobscouse, lobscouse, stew of pieces of meat, vegetables, and hard tack. Milk toast, hard tack soaked in condensed milk, Borden had just started to can. Now let's look at some historical context after the Civil War. According to the San Bernardino Sun, here's some more historical context surrounding Turkey on Thanksgiving and the production of such. For centuries, different cultures and religions have celebrated their harvests with a Thanksgiving feast, but the version of the Pilgrim's Feast didn't come about until the 1800s. It was during this period that roasted turkey became ingrained in the traditional American Thanksgiving meal. California's early settlers didn't have wild turkey as an option for their Thanksgiving feasts, since the birds were not native to the region. Wild turkeys were first introduced into California in 1877, by private ranchers on Santa Cruz Island for game hunting. Unlike their domesticated brethren, wild turkeys are excellent short-distance flyers, and they are good sport for hunters. Also, most turkey fans don't know that a male turkey is a tom or gobbler, a young male is a jake, females are hens, a young female is a jenny, and babies are a polt or chick. Turkey production in California grew steadily through the late 1800s, but it lagged behind the eastern and midwest states. In 1869, California's production records showed 157,228 turkeys being raised on poultry ranches, as compared to 1,459,069 chickens. The total human population of the state at that time was about 550,000. Today, the broad-breasted white turkey is the most widely used breed of commercially raised turkeys. They cannot fly and weigh up to 40 pounds. In the larger cities, many residents in the late 1800s ate Thanksgiving dinner at a hotel restaurant. In 1876, San Bernardino residents could get a complete Thanksgiving dinner including turkey stuffed with oysters, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin, lemon, or custard pie, for 25 cents at the Arcade Hotel. The price of a Thanksgiving turkey dinner at a restaurant remained surprisingly steady for many years in the late 1800s. In November 1894, you could still get a turkey dinner with oyster dressing, cranberry sauce, and English plum pudding, for 25 cents at People's Restaurant in Los Angeles. By 1910, the price for a restaurant turkey dinner with the traditional sides had risen to about 50 cents. Thanksgiving ham was introduced right around the same time as turkey, or the late 19th century. And when it comes to consumption stats, presuming that waste doesn't impact the consumption stats enough, would be around 12,833,333 hams consumed per Thanksgiving, while some were also thrown away. 
Now, finally, to finish off this segment of this huge chapter, which is the first half of this video essay, let's get into the statistics when it comes to Turkey. According to CountingAnimals.com, here's how many turkeys that are actually consumed on Thanksgiving. It's an article written and published by Harish on November 18th, 2015. Let David Dudickley do his job again. Da 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 da! The Thanksgiving season is upon us and, horrifically, upon turkeys. We will see their carcasses everywhere sliced and served on the lunch plate, or dressed and stuffed on the dinner table. They will be talked about at the water cooler and laughed about on late night TV. There will even be turkey flavored potato chips and turkey infused vodka. What must be the scale of an annual ritual concerning one species of birds that they will so invade our lives for a week or two? Exactly how many turkeys do we Americans kill for Thanksgiving? The National Turkey Federation did estimate an answer to this question and came up with 46 million, but provided no methodology or reasoning behind their estimate. This blog post fills the gap but arrives at a more conservative number of 37 million as likely closer to the correct answer. From the monthly USDA reports on poultry slaughter, we know that we kill over 235 million turkeys each year in 2014, we killed 236.6 million of them. But, it is not entirely straightforward to estimate the number of them we kill for our consumption during the Thanksgiving season because turkeys are killed year-round at approximately the same rate. It makes business sense to do so killing at a steady rate, without sudden spikes during the holiday season, uses the machinery, labor, and other infrastructure more efficiently. Since we eat more turkeys around Thanksgiving despite not killing them at a higher rate during the season, most of the turkeys we eat at Thanksgiving are ones who are killed months earlier and kept frozen. The USDA keeps track of the stocks of meat kept frozen in public and private warehouses before they are moved for retail to grocery stores, restaurants, and food service companies. Based on the USDA reports on cold storage, the following bar graph shows the weight of whole turkey carcasses as well as parts of turkeys, such as breasts and legs, kept frozen in warehouses in the U.S. on the last day of each month. From January 2013 to September 2015, the most recent month for which data is available. It is easy to notice the cyclic nature of the bar graph above there are sharp drops in the amount stored in warehouses, especially of whole turkey carcasses, during October and November. These drops represent the movement of frozen turkeys from warehouses to grocery stores and other food establishments for sale or consumption. Timed for peak consumption in late November, this process begins in mid-October and lasts through mid to late November. During any given month, the total weight of turkeys retailed, i.e. moved from cold storage for retail, or consumed can be estimated as the weight of turkeys killed during that month plus the weight of turkeys in cold storage on the last day of the previous month minus the weight of turkeys in cold storage on the last day of that current month. For example, the total weight of turkeys consumed slash retailed during April is the weight of turkeys killed during April plus the weight of turkeys in cold storage on March 31st minus the weight of turkeys in cold storage on April 30th. The only little snag left is that the turkey slaughter data is reported in live weight while the cold storage data is reported in carcass weight or the actual weight of what is stored in the warehouse. The live weight of an animal is the weight of an animal when he slash she is alive. The carcass weight or the dressed weight of a turkey is usually the weight of the carcass excluding the head, feet, and certain internal organs but including bones, skin, fat, liver, gizzard, and neck. 
The ratio of the carcass weight to live weight of a turkey varies between 77.74% to 80.03% depending on age, gender, and strain of the turkey. Since USDA reports on turkey slaughter and storage are not consistently separated by age, gender, or strain, I will use the midpoint of this range, 78.885%, as the conversion factor from live weight to carcass weight. The following graph displays the estimated carcass weight of the turkeys slaughtered during each month, between January 2013 and September 2015, and the estimated carcass weight of the turkeys consumed slash retailed during each of those months. In the graph above, the additional weight of the turkeys consumed slash retailed during October and November beyond what is typically consumed slash retailed during the other 10 months can be estimated as the carcass weight of the turkeys killed for Thanksgiving. During the last 24 months for which data is available, from October 2013 to September 2015, the average carcass weight of turkeys consumed slash retailed per month, excluding October and November, was 431.96 million pounds. This would represent a baseline rate of consumption of turkeys if we did not have the Thanksgiving season. This consumption is usually in the form of turkey slices in sandwiches, turkey burgers, turkey sausages, and ground turkey, directly purchased by consumers or served at lunch delis and workplace cafeterias. For obvious economic reasons, these turkey products are made from the larger turkeys ones with a carcass weight larger than the average of about 24 pounds. The months of October and November, however, are different with a significantly higher rate at which turkeys, mostly smaller and whole turkeys, move out of warehouses and into supermarkets, food service stations, and restaurant menus. Since Thanksgiving appears in late November, it is a reasonable assumption that almost all of this inventory of turkeys a total average of 1,310.9 million pounds during these two months is intended for sale or consumption during the Thanksgiving season. Now, the season itself is not just limited to the Thanksgiving week as early as mid-November, food service cafeteria set up turkey carving stations on some days, restaurants add turkeys on their menus and workplace parties feature whole roast turkeys. I would conservatively estimate that turkey consumption during at least one-third of the month of November, or ten days of November, is Thanksgiving-inspired consumption with little or no baseline consumption of the more processed turkey products like deli slices. So, the baseline consumption, not inspired by Thanksgiving, during October and November can be estimated at 431.96 million pounds during October plus two-thirds of 431.96 million pounds during November, a total of 719.94 million pounds. The additional weight of turkeys consumed slash retailed for the Thanksgiving season per year, therefore, is 1310.9 to 719.94590.96 million pounds. Based on a survey reported by the National Turkey Foundation, the average weight of turkeys purchased at Thanksgiving is 16 pounds much smaller than the overall average carcass weight, 24 pounds, of turkeys raised in the United States. The 590.96 million pounds of turkeys consumed slash retailed for the Thanksgiving season, therefore, represents 590.96 slash 1636.9 million turkeys. We kill about 37 million turkeys for Thanksgiving. It is a human weakness that we can be overwhelmed by the scale of the massacre these numbers represent, 
but lose sight of the suffering endured by each hen or tom who lies dead on our Thanksgiving table. From the time they were babies in hatcheries to the time they were killed, the turkeys we eat would have endured a horrific litany of abuses. Our expression of gratitude for the joys in our lives need not come coupled with the theft of every mundane and every significant joy from the life of another individual. It is easy to leave turkeys alone and let them have something to be thankful for as well. To this day, Thanksgiving consumption statistics, when it comes to the consumption of both ham and turkey, waste doesn't necessarily supersede consumption at all, even though it is rampant, and we'll get into that next. We're skipping 1621, 1789, and the Civil War. Even when there was war, genocide, famine, and slavery, the food was rather scarce in the first place. Plus, if they had any food to waste, they didn't have trash cans back then. They burned their trash or gave them to the farm animals that just happened to come walking by. Now, let's start analyzing the history of Thanksgiving food waste during the time between the late 1800s to early 1900s. The history of food waste itself in America, according to a Medium article written and published by Andrea Kang on September 30th, 2018, she explains more of this for us. I'll give David Dudickley a little break here and read a good portion of the article myself. Pre-World War I, late 1800s to 1914. This is the time period where things began to change. Industrialization and manufactured products created a convenience for families that led to food waste. People were disposing food waste on the streets and uncovered garbage cans. City officials began implementing proper sanitation laws and waste removal. Apparently, during this time, incineration was too expensive. Cities like Salt Lake City reused garbage in different ways. The city transported edible garbage to local animal feed companies. Non-edible waste was used as fill in road construction. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, industrialization and manufactured products drastically changed how Americans consumed food. Food became commercialized and went from farm to table and from to factory to table. Consequently, families started to waste food because it was less expensive and more accessible. Development of Canning Cities tried to combat the rise of food waste via industrialization through the development of canning. The invention of tin cans in factories led to an efficient and easy method of reducing food waste through longer shelf lives. World War I, 1914 to 1918. During World War I, American farms were essential for providing the entire Allied forces, Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, and 20 other countries, with food. The U.S. Food Administration was developed at this time to manage and organize food production and distribution. Because food conservation was purely voluntary, it was portrayed as patriotic. Advertisements most aggressively encourage the saving of meat, sugar, animal fats, and wheat with promotions like Meatless Tuesdays and Wheatless Wednesdays. These ingredients could be made into easily preservable and transportable meals, while the public at home was prompted to eat more fresh vegetables and fruits. The campaign proved effective. Between 1918 and 1919, for example, consumption in America was cut back by 15%, and the amount of food shipped to Europe doubled. According to the website known as World War One Centennial.org, here's Thanksgiving during the Great War. Thanksgiving is a time when many people take the time to gather with family and friends to feast, give thanks, celebrate, or maybe cheer for their favorite NFL team from the comfort of their own homes. During World War I, however, the Thanksgiving holiday was slightly different. On the home front, people were encouraged to cut back on food items such as sugar, meat, fats, and wheat so that food could be sent to troops fighting overseas. Many newspapers across the country printed alternative recipe ideas that cut back on food items, especially sugar. 
American families were inspired to grow their own gardens and use homegrown food in their Thanksgiving meals instead of buying food from the local food market. In fact, as part of his annual Thanksgiving proclamation, President Woodrow Wilson in 1916 reminded Americans of the privations in Europe. And I also urge and suggest our duty in this our day of peace and abundance, to think in deep sympathy of the stricken peoples of the world upon whom the curse and terror of war has so pitilessly fallen, and to contribute out of our abundant means to the relief of their suffering. Our people could in no better way show their real attitude towards the present struggle of the nations than by contributing out of their abundance to the relief of the suffering which war has brought in its train. Once America was in the war, there were efforts to enable military members in the combat zones, aboard ships, and stationed at military camps, to celebrate Thanksgiving. Food was rationed overseas, to ensure that troops enjoyed a proper Thanksgiving feast. The standard military ration was greatly improved for the Thanksgiving meal. The government printing office even published cookbooks so members of the armed forces could prepare their Thanksgiving favorites. Decades later, Thanksgiving is one of the most wasteful holidays when it comes to food a year, likely being in second place right after Christmas, in both the roast game and post-roast game eras. Now, there are campaigns trying to encourage people to stop wasting food. Millions of dollars went to charities and organizations to help end child hunger. It's sad that the holiday of being thankful for the food on the table is likely one of the biggest days of food waste. And here's a graphic, for example, out of the dozens upon dozens of them, according to Spoiler Alert. Now let's move on to what may or may not be the longest part in the history of Thanksgiving dinner, called the history of roast preparation and dinner preparation time, including some factoids preceding 1621. Let's go. Starting in 1621 with a bit of detail, picturing how the first autumn Thanksgiving dinner was prepared, cooked, and served. But before they had their iconic Plymouth dinner, they typically fasted, likely until those people arrived with the food. Here is a bit of more context when it comes to the history of Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving dinner. According to History.com, Pilgrims held their second Thanksgiving celebration in 1623 to mark the end of a long drought that had threatened the year's harvest and prompted Governor Bradford to call for a religious fast. But the history of Thanksgiving and fasting goes way back before 1623, let alone 1621. According to Wikipedia, the days of Thanksgiving was a religious tradition. Let David Dudickley come back and read this after he took a break, shall we? In Protestant Christianity, a day of humiliation or fasting was a publicly proclaimed day of fasting and prayer in response to an event thought to signal God's judgment. A day of thanksgiving was a day set aside for public worship in thanksgiving for events believed to signal God's mercy and favor. Such a day might be proclaimed by the civil authority or the church. National days of prayer for specific occasions had been ordered in England as early as 1009 by King Ethelred the Unready. Occasional days of fasting were held in England in the middle of the 16th century under Elizabeth I in response to plague outbreaks and the Armada Crisis of 1588. Puritans especially embraced occasional days of fasting. By the middle of the 17th century, days of thanksgiving were celebrated in New England annually in November. A day of humiliation and fasting might be proclaimed in response to a drought, flood, fire, military defeat, or plague. They might also be held before the undertaking of a difficult endeavor. People were expected to search themselves for sin and to repent in order to appease God's wrath. Everyone between the ages of 16 and 60 was expected to spend the entire day in fasting, church attendance, 
listening to sermons of exhortation and meditating on their sin. A day of thanksgiving might be held in response to signs of God's mercy, such as rain allowing a good harvest, arrival of needed supplies, or recovery from sickness. They might also be held after a long period of general success and lack of disaster. On days of thanksgiving, the faithful would also spend a day in church attendance, but would pray thankfully, sing psalms of praise, and feast. Puritan feast days were more solemn and demanding than traditional Christian feasts. Days of thanksgiving were celebrated with joy and thanks for recent blessing, but Puritans also saw them as days to look forward to the coming of the kingdom of God. Puritans rejected the traditional Christian liturgical calendar of holy days, including Easter and Christmas, as well as saints' days, but set aside special days in response to current events. However, natural cycles caused penance and rebirth to continue to be associated with spring, as had been the case with Easter. Thanksgiving days were normally celebrated in autumn following the harvest. There is some more context on whether or not the Thanksgiving of 1621 was actually, quote-unquote, the first to ever take place. But was the 1621 Thanksgiving the first ever? No, of course it isn't. According to the Library of Congress's Wise Guide, from 2002, Miles Standish didn't get an invitation to these first Thanksgivings in 1541, 1564, and 1610. These celebrations predate the Plymouth colonists and their Feast of Gratitude in 1621. In May 1541, Spanish explorer Francisco Vázquez de Coronado and 1,500 men celebrated at the Palo del Canyon located in the modern-day Texas Panhandle after their expedition from Mexico City in search of gold. In 1959 the Texas Society Daughters of the American Colonists commemorated the event as the first Thanksgiving. Another first Thanksgiving occurred on June 30, 1564, when French Huguenot colonists celebrated in a settlement near Jacksonville, Florida. This first Thanksgiving was later commemorated at the Fort Carolina Memorial on the St. John's River in eastern Jacksonville. The harsh winter of 1609-1610 generated a famine that caused the deaths of 430 of the 490 settlers. In the spring of 1610, Colonists in Jamestown, Virginia, enjoyed a Thanksgiving service after English supply ships arrived with food. This colonial celebration has also been considered the first Thanksgiving. And according to another History.com article, here are some events relating to Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving dinner history. 1541, the Spanish explorers hold a feast. In 1598, a second early feast among Spanish. A second Texas town claims to have been the real site of the first Thanksgiving in America. In 1598, a wealthy Spanish dignitary named Juan de Oñante was granted lands among the Pueblo Indians in the American Southwest. He decided to blaze a new path directly across the Chihuahua Desert to reach the Rio Grande. Oñante's party of 500 soldiers, women and children, barely survived the harrowing journey, nearly dying of thirst and exhaustion. When they reached the river, two horses reportedly drank so much water that their stomachs burst. After 10 days of rest and recuperation near modern-day San Elizario, Texas, Oñante ordered a feast of Thanksgiving, which one of his men described in his journal, We built a great bonfire and roasted the meat and fish, and then all sat down to a repast 
the like of which we had never enjoyed before. We were happy that our trials were over, as happy as were the passengers in the ark when they saw the dove returning with the olive branch in his beak, bringing tidings that the deluge had subsided. November 23rd, 1775. Boston Patriots call for Thanksgiving. In the run-up to the Revolutionary War, a group of Boston Patriots published a pointedly anti-British proclamation for a day of public Thanksgiving throughout the Massachusetts colony to be held November 23rd, 1775. That such a band of union founded upon the best principles unites the American colonies that our rights and privileges are so far preserved to us notwithstanding all the attempts of our barbarous enemies to deprive us of them, and to offer up humble and fervent prayers to Almighty God for the whole British Empire, especially for the United American Colonies. Note that these are other slash minor events that would have fit into the history of Thanksgiving itself, but it isn't because, because the history of Thanksgiving mainly surrounds the history of Thanksgiving dinner just as much or slightly more than it does to Thanksgiving itself, and only that. But now let's go back to the main focus of this segment, which is roast and dinner preparation time in history. Now let's get to the dinner part before anyone let alone any colonist could ever prepare, cook, and serve the food. After so much time of fasting, they must kill the food first, mainly deer, wildfowl, harvest vegetables, and other foods, or at least let some of the Native Americans do it for them. Let's put into perspective how many people were actually there during this festival. This wasn't just for a day. This was for three days straight, from November 26th to the 29th of 1621. At the first autumn Thanksgiving, colonists were likely outnumbered more than two to one by their Native American guests. Winslow writes, Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and amongst the rest of their greatest king, Massasoit, was some 90 men. The preceding winter had been a harsh one for the colonists. 78% of the women who had traveled on the Mayflower had perished that winter, leaving only around 50 colonists to attend the first Thanksgiving. According to eyewitness accounts, among the pilgrims, there were 22 men, just 4 women, and other 25 children and teenagers. How was the first Thanksgiving cooked? Winslow wrote that the Wampanoag guests arrived with an offering of five deer. Culinary historians speculate that the deer was roasted on a spit over a smoldering fire and that the colonists might have used some of the venison to whip up a hearty stew. So in summary, they gathered the food they ate on the first Thanksgiving, prepared it, cooked the deer on a spit over a fire, while the colonists might have used some of the venison to whip up a hearty stew along with the deer, and this is after a long time of religious fasting that goes all the way back to 1009, 532 years before the actual first Thanksgiving ever to date, which is May of 1541. Skipping ahead to 1779, three years after the founding of our nation, and ten years before George Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation, and according to... AmericanHeritage.com This menu for a New England Thanksgiving dinner is taken from a letter written in 1779 by Juliana Smith to her dear cousin Betsy a colonial kitchen. Haunch of venison. Roast china pork. Roast turkey. Pigeon pasties. Roast goose. Squash. Onions in cream cauliflower, potatoes, raw celery, mince meat pie, pumpkin pie, apple pie, Indian pudding, plum pudding, cider. You know nobody can exceed the two grandmothers at telling tales of all the things they have seen themselves, wrote Juliana Smith. As Thanksgiving Day approached, Grandmother Smith, who is sometimes a little desponding of spirit as you well know, 
did her best to persuade us that it would be better to make it a day of fasting and prayer in view of the wickedness of our friends and the vileness of our enemies. I am sure you can hear grandmother say that and see her shake her cap border. But my dear father brought her to a more proper frame of mind, so that by the time the day came she was ready to enjoy it almost as well as grandmother Worthington did, and she, you will remember, always sees the bright side. While it would be difficult to set forth a single traditional Thanksgiving menu, the preparations related by Juliana Smith that went into this dinner were certainly typical of early New England Thanksgivings. This year it was Uncle Simeon's turn to have the dinner at his house, but of course we all help them as they help us when it is our turn, and there is always enough for us all to do. All the baking of pies and cakes was done at our house and we had the big oven heated and filled twice each day for three days before it was all done. And everything was good, though we did have to do without some things that ought to be used. Neither love nor, paper, money could buy raisins, but our good red cherries dried without the pits, did almost as well and happily Uncle Simeon still had some spices in store. The tables were set in the dining hall and even that big room had no space to spare when we were all seated. Apparently roast beef was part of the traditional menu for this family, but of course we could have no roast beef. None of us have tasted beef this three years back as it all must go to the army, and too little they get, poor fellows. But, Naquitimas hunters were able to get us a fine red deer, so that we had a good haunch of venison on each table. There was an abundance of vegetables on the table, including one which I do not believe you have yet seen. Uncle Simeon had imported the seed from England just before the war began and only this year was there enough for table use. It is called celery and you eat it without cooking. Cider was served instead of wine, with the explanation that Uncle Simeon was saving his cask for the sick. Juliana added that the pumpkin pies, apple tarts and big Indian puddings lacked for nothing save appetite by the time we had got round to them. Counting the Reverend Mr. Smith, his wife, two grandmothers, and the six Livingstons from next door, there were forty people at the dinner. Uncle Simeon was in his best mood, and you know how good that is. He kept both tables in a roar of laughter with his droll stories of the days when he was studying medicine in Edinburgh, and afterwards he and father and Uncle Paul joined in singing hymns and ballads. You know how fine their voices go together. Then we all sang a hymn and afterwards my dear father led us in prayer, remembering all absent friends, we did not rise from the table until it was quite dark, and then when the dishes had been cleared away we all got round the fire as close as we could, and cracked nuts, and sang songs and told stories. At least some told and others listened. You know nobody can exceed the two grandmothers at telling tales of all the things they have seen themselves, and repeating those of the early years in New England. We'll get into 1863 later in this video essay. Here are some of the rest of the events from a History.com article I cited earlier. November 30th, 1876. The first Thanksgiving football game. The very first Thanksgiving football game was played between Princeton and Yale in 1876. American football was in its infancy, but the sport and the Thanksgiving tradition quickly caught on. By 1893, 40,000 spectators showed up to watch the Princeton-Yale Thanksgiving game in New York's Manhattan Field. November 27th, 1924, First Macy's Parade, originally called the Christmas Parade, Macy's department store in New York City launched its first ever parade on Thanksgiving Day 1924. 
The Six Mile Parade route featured live elephants and camels from the Central Park Zoo. The animals were replaced by oversized rubber balloons in 1927. And finally, last but not least, November 19th, 1963, the first turkey pardon. While claims have been made that Abraham Lincoln or Harry Truman were the first presidents to pardon a Thanksgiving turkey, the credit belongs to John F. Kennedy, who soared the life of a 55-pound gobbler in 1963. Quote, unquote, well, just let this one grow, joked JFK. It's our Thanksgiving present to him. The impromptu turkey reprieve was just days before Kennedy's fateful trip to Dallas. The first turkey to be pardoned in 1963 is extremely lucky, unlike President John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was assassinated six days before Thanksgiving took place all across America. Overall, technically, the first Thanksgiving happened in May of 1541, which took place in the spring. But unlike the Thanksgiving of 1541, 1564, and 1610, the Thanksgiving of 1621 was the first to ever take place in the autumn, which is the same season we celebrate Thanksgiving to this day for over 400 years. I will put up a disclaimer right as we are going into the history of Thanksgiving itself. It's clearly not to shatter the history timeline of the Thanksgiving history lesson as we know it, because it's due to a seasonal technicality. In fact, this contextualizes Thanksgiving a lot better than anyone could have ever imagined. Okay, just to get things clear. The first Thanksgiving ever happened in the spring of 1541. The first summer Thanksgiving happened in early summer of 1564. The second spring Thanksgiving happened in 1610. The first autumn Thanksgiving happened in 1621. Now, in the present day, how and how long Americans prepare Thanksgiving dinner varies significantly. When it comes to the meat choices, the sides, the way they dish the food out, the way they cook it, etc. Now let's move on to the recap of this huge first half chunk of the video essay in part five of the history of Thanksgiving dinner, the finale slash conclusion, and then a disclaimer before we get into the history of Thanksgiving itself in America and Canada. Welcome to the end of the first big chunk of the video essay. In part one, when it comes to calories, we've learned that calories did not exist in 1621, but only centuries later, and we've learned potentially the average amount of calories per serving per person according to the American Farm Bureau Federation. But luckily, there are other estimates when it comes to people who might eat less. And I will give you the link and cite those sources in the description box down below. In part two, we've learned the history of Thanksgiving consumption stats slash turkey and ham stats and not very much from there on out. In part three, we've learned about the history of Thanksgiving food waste started around the late 1800s to 1914 and continued to the present day. And last but not least, in part four of this huge chunk of the video essay, we've learned about the history of Thanksgiving in a sense where the actual context of Thanksgiving is fulfilled and contextualized. And then we've learned the history of dinner slash roast preparation time, which is pretty damn easy to do when you think about it. Now, let's move on to the Midway segment before we close out this huge chunk of the video essay. Before we move into the history of Thanksgiving itself, I just had the great idea of slowly transitioning with this Midway segment. Here are some other important key factoids and facts. How many NFL games were held on Thanksgiving? Let's start off with football. This is going to be the longest part of this Midway segment. From 1920 to 2021, within the span of 101 years to date, with 74 Thanksgiving football games held between 1920 and 1940, 
25 Thanksgiving football games held between 1945 to 1959, 27 Thanksgiving football games held between 1960 and 1969, 72 Thanksgiving football games held between 1970 to 2005, and 47 Thanksgiving football games held between 2006 to 2021. Gives us a total of 245 total NFL Thanksgiving football games to date. This could turn into 248 by the time Thanksgiving 2022 comes around. NBA hasn't held a Thanksgiving game since 2010 or something. And finally, Major League Baseball used to have baseball games on Thanksgiving, but marked Thanksgiving as the close of each season, as this article, written and published for the MLB by Mike Bertha, shows. America is the home of Elvis Presley the supersize value meal and the Humpty Dance. We set off fireworks on the 4th of July and celebrate Thanksgiving by watching football and listening to our uncles inappropriately pontificate about immigration reform. But long before Thanksgiving became about discounted surround sound systems and festive sitcom episodes, it was a day reserved for togetherness and baseball. In 1855, a piece in the Clipper highlighted the popularity of the national pastime on the American holiday. There seemed to be a general turnout of the baseball clubs in the city and vicinity, on Thursday, November 29. Among those playing were the Continental, Columbia, Putnam, Empire, Eagle, Knickerbocker, Gotham, Baltic, Pioneer, and Excelsior clubs. Just a few years later, the Evening Standard in New Bedford, Massachusetts, noted that the holiday marked the official close of the baseball season. In the afternoon there were several scrub games, that is games which the various clubs unite and play together. The regular ball season is considered to close with Thanksgiving, though many games will doubtless be played through the winter when the weather will permit. A New York Times article from 1887 announced a game to be played on the polo grounds on Thanksgiving Day. Thirteen years later, the Times published an account crediting the 1887 contest as the origin of indoor baseball dash, which evolved over time to become softball. Eventually, Yale and Princeton ended up playing American football on the holiday, which started a vast tradition of pigskin on the last Thursday of November. Baseball obviously became a more organized endeavor that typically culminates with some fancy series in October. So, as the chatter of your relatives starts to fade while you're slipping into that sweet, tryptophan-fueled slumber, remember that it wasn't always the Lions and Cowboys entertaining Americans on Thanksgiving but good old boys on sand lots across the country batting baseballs in the blistering cold. Anything other than sports, like TV shows, movies, and late night specials, or anything else, aren't important enough to be mentioned here. And now, we move into the second half of the video essay. Let's start the entire history timeline off with this. After a long time analyzing the history of Thanksgiving dinner, now let's analyze the history of Thanksgiving itself. Let's start with the first Thanksgiving feast. This one is published by Catherine Lamb on October 5th, 2020, courtesy of the website known as food52.com. Take it away, text to speech bot David Dudeclay. A few years ago, I made my inner history nerd unbelievably giddy and spent a few weeks digging into one question, what was actually eaten at the first Thanksgiving? The results were surprising, no turkey, illuminating, and just plain curious. So leading up to November, I thought I'd give you something to chew on besides what's on your table. First, let's set the scene. The modern Thanksgiving holiday is based off a festival shared by the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag Native American tribe at Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts, in 1621. The feast purportedly celebrated the colonists' first successful harvest in the New World. While modern Thanksgiving always lands on the fourth Thursday in November, the original went down sometime earlier in autumn, 
closer to harvest time. Parenthetically, I'll note that Thanksgiving was originally a one-off. Abraham Lincoln was the first to bring back Thanksgiving in 1863, when a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale convinced him that a nationally celebrated Thanksgiving holiday would unite the country in the aftermath of the Civil War. From then on Thanksgiving was celebrated annually, typically on the last Thursday in November, but the date wasn't made official until decreed by Congress in 1941. There are only two surviving documents that reference the original Thanksgiving harvest meal. They describe a feast of freshly killed deer, assorted wildfowl, a bounty of cod and bass, and flint, a native variety of corn harvested by the Native Americans, which was eaten as cornbread and porridge. These two sources contain all we know firsthand about the first Thanksgiving food. The rest of the menu we can only piece together, based upon what was available, what both groups ate in times of celebration, and what the Native Americans would have, literally, brought to the table. Wildfowl First and foremost, there would be wildfowl most likely duck or geese, but potentially carrier pigeons or swans. That's right turkey might not have even been present at the first Thanksgiving. The birds were probably stuffed with onions and nuts instead of the bread cubes and sausage more familiar to us today, than boiled or roasted. Seafood Seafood is a rare sight on a modern Thanksgiving table, but the colonists most likely had fish, eel, and shellfish, such as lobster and mussels, at their feast. Produce Vegetarians would not have gone hungry in 1621. Native crops such as peas, beans, squash, and the aforementioned flint corn would have likely made an appearance on the Thanksgiving table alongside vegetables brought over from England, such as cabbage and carrots. In fact, just like what you learned in kindergarten, there is some evidence that the Native Americans did teach the colonists how to plant beans, squash, and other local crops. If you want to learn more about indigenous American cooking, check out our interview with a sous chef. What wasn't served at the first Thanksgiving? It is also worth noting what was not present at the first Thanksgiving feast. There were no cloud-like heaps of mashed potatoes, since white potatoes had not yet crossed over from South America. There was no gravy either, since the colonists didn't yet have mills to produce flour. There was no sweet potato casserole, with many marshmallows or without, since tuberous roots had not yet been introduced from the Caribbean. Cranberries may have been incorporated into Wampanoag dishes to add tartness, but it would be another 50 years before someone first wrote about cooking them with sugar to make a sauce to eat with, meat. The now ubiquitous cranberry sauce. Also, since there was probably no refined sugar in the colonies in 1621, it would have been prohibitively expensive, the point was mood. There were, however, pumpkins. No flour, no sugar that's right, there was nary a pie. No apple, no pecan, no pumpkin at the first Thanksgiving table. Well, pumpkins were probably present, just most likely stewed with vinegar and currants. So this year, as you're digging into your green bean casserole and heaping your mashed potatoes into a soon-to-be gravy-lava-filled volcano, be thankful. After all, you could be eating a heaping plate full of two-day-old potage with a side of eel, instead. Now let's move forward in the timeline by 168 years. On September 28th, 1789, just before leaving for recess, the first federal congress passed a resolution asking that the President of the United States recommended to the nation a day of Thanksgiving. A few days later, President George Washington issued a proclamation naming Thursday, November 26th, 1789, as a day of public Thanksgiving. The first time Thanksgiving was celebrated under the new Constitution. Subsequent presidents issued Thanksgiving proclamations, but the dates and even months of the celebrations varied. It wasn't until President Abraham Lincoln's 1863 proclamation that Thanksgiving was regularly commemorated each year on the last Thursday of November. And speaking of 1863, that's our next chapter.
According to AbrahamLincolnOnline.org, here is Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Proclamation of Thanksgiving and the context beforehand. This is the proclamation which set the president for America's National Day of Thanksgiving. During his administration, President Lincoln issued many orders similar to this. For example, on November 28, 1861, he ordered government departments closed for a local day of Thanksgiving. Sarah Josepha Hale, a 74-year-old magazine editor, wrote a letter to Lincoln on September 28, 1863, urging him to have the day of our annual Thanksgiving made a national and fixed union festival. She explained, You may have observed that, for some years past, there has been an increasing interest felt in our land to have the Thanksgiving held on the same day in all the states. It now needs national recognition and authoritative fixation only to become permanently an American custom and institution. Prior to this, each state scheduled its own Thanksgiving holiday at different times, mainly in New England and other northern states. President Lincoln responded to Mrs. Hale's request immediately. Unlike several of his predecessors who ignored her petitions altogether, in her letter to Lincoln, she mentioned that she had been advocating a national Thanksgiving date for 15 years as the editor of Doty's Ladybook. George Washington was the first president to proclaim a day of Thanksgiving, issuing his request on October 3rd, 1789, exactly 74 years before Lincoln's. The document before sets apart the last Thursday of November as a day of Thanksgiving and praise, according to an April 1st, 1864 letter from John Nicolay, one of President Lincoln's secretaries. This document was written by Secretary of State William Seward, and the original was in his handwriting. On October 3, 1863, fellow cabinet member Gideon Wells recorded in his diary how he complimented Seward on his work. A year later, the manuscript was sold to benefit Union troops. And the proclamation goes something like this. Washington, D.C., October 3rd, 1863, by the President of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln, a proclamation. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and beautiful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. While that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union, needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuffle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the mines, as well of iron and coal as of the precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield, and the country rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should have solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe 
the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble persistence for our national perverseness and disobedience. Commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, the third day of October, in this year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th, by the President Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. Our next chapter in the history of Thanksgiving itself continues to go forward all the way up to 1941. Let's begin, shall we? But before we do, we gotta go into the history of the first Canadian Thanksgiving, which is April 15th, 1872. Let's go, eh? This one is going to be short, but according to Wikipedia, of all sources, quote, the earlier Thanksgiving celebrations in Canada has been attributed to the earlier onset of winter in the north, thus ending the harvest season earlier. Thanksgiving in Canada did not have a fixed date until the late 19th century. Prior to Canadian Confederation, many of the individual colonial governors of the Canadian provinces had declared their own days of Thanksgiving. The first official Canadian Thanksgiving occurred on April 15th, 1872, when the nation was celebrating the Prince of Wales's recovery from a serious illness. By the end of the 19th century, Thanksgiving Day was normally celebrated on November 6th. In the late 19th century, the militia staged quote-unquote, sham battles for public entertainment on Thanksgiving Day. The militia agitated for an earlier date for the holiday, so they could use the warmer weather to draw bigger crowds. However, when the First World War ended, the Armistice Day holiday was usually held during the same week. To prevent the two holidays from clashing with one another, in 1957, the Canadian Parliament proclaimed Thanksgiving to be observed on its present date on the second Monday of October. So the first Canadian Thanksgiving wasn't even held in October before, let alone November. It was held in April. Really? Wow. Okay, moving on now. Even though Thanksgiving was happening before any of this occurred, here's what happened in the 1940s, right around World War II, until House Joint Resolution 41 was signed into law in 1941. The president set the date for the Thanksgiving holiday in 1940 for a second year in a row. President Franklin D. Roosevelt moved the holiday from the fourth to the third Thursday of the month to create a longer holiday shopping season as the country recovered from the Great Depression. Parts of the country celebrated the holiday on different days, when 16 states refused to accept the proclamation and kept the holiday on the last Thursday. To avoid such a conflict in the future, the resolution fixed the date of the public holiday. The public law incorporates a Senate amendment that designates Thanksgiving as the fourth Thursday of the month, rather than the last Thursday to account for in November with five Thursdays. On October 6, 1941, the 77th Congress, led by House Speaker Sam Rayburn, a Democrat from Texas, Majority Leader John W. McCormick, a Democrat from Massachusetts, Minority Leader Joseph W. Martin Jr., a Republican also from Massachusetts, got together and passed the Thanksgiving holiday bill. On December 9th, 
1941, two days after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, the bill was printed and sent to President Roosevelt to finally be signed on December 26th, 1941, a day after Christmas. And it reads as follows. House Joint Resolution 41, making the last Thursday in November a legal holiday, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the last Thursday of November in each year after the year 1941 be known as Thanksgiving Day, and in hereby made a legal public holiday to all intents and purposes, and in the same manner as the first day of January, the 22nd day of February, the 30th day of May, the 4th day of July, the first Monday of September, the 11th day of November, and Christmas Day are now made by law public holidays. Passed the House of Representatives October 6th, 1941. In the Senate of the United States, December 9th, 1941, resolved that the joint resolution from the House of Representatives, House Joint Resolution 41, entitled Joint Resolution Making the Last Thursday in November a Legal Holiday, do pass with the following amendments. Line 3, strike out last and insert fourth. Amend the title so as to read, Joint Resolution Making the Fourth Thursday in November a Legal Holiday. One of the responsibilities of the clerk of the House is to certify the passage of all bills and resolutions. This copy of the resolution was attested to by South Trimble, a former member of Congress and long-serving clerk of the House. The next big event to be covered is going to be a very interesting one indeed. The Great Cranberry Scare of 1959. Now we transition into the Great Cranberry Scare of 1959, according to an NPR article written and published by Adrian Ma and Stacy Vanek Smith. Quote, when scientists found traces of a carcinogen in a batch of cranberries just ahead of Thanksgiving, in 1959, the government issued a food warning across the nation. People panicked, and even though the contamination was limited, the cranberry industry ground to a halt. It didn't help that the White House, for its Thanksgiving dinner that year, replaced cranberry sauce with applesauce. But the cranberry business survived. In fact, it went on to thrive. People were warned not to eat them for fear of actually getting infected by pesticide contamination. So in other words, after a carcinogen was found in the cranberries, there came a scare that shook Americans across the country, but was relieved and went ahead to eat them as a side dish and essential part to traditional Thanksgiving dinner, except for the White House and then some. It was so sensational that Robert Williams and the Groovers made a song about it called Cranberry Blues. And it goes a little something like this, with lyrics on the screen. Stick. I tried to get my baby bird downtown Tried real hard but they couldn't be found I went to see old Clem and he was sick in bed He said don't eat a cranberry or you'll soon be dead
and I got the cranberry blues. She said she wanted cranberries awfully bad. And if I didn't get her something, she'd go mad. I guess my baby, I'm a gonna lose. Because there ain't no cure for the cranberry blues, yeah. Cranberry, cranberry blues. Cranberry, cranberry blues. Shortly after this scare, the fears of contamination grew short-lived, and decades later, we still look back at it 62 years later. Now we're analyzing Thanksgiving post-1959 to the present day. Something to add to the holidays and what day each one lands on. According to the same Wikipedia article I cited earlier, since 1971, when the American Uniform Monday Holiday Act took effect, the American observance of Columbus Day that coincided with the Canadian observance of Thanksgiving. Now let's quickly summarize Thanksgiving of the present day. Thanksgiving in America, which usually lands on either the 4th or last Thursday on any given November each year since 1941, has been a traditionally historic holiday, and its dinner history is equally so. For Canada, it's similar, but the date is set for the second Monday in October. Overall, what we have learned in this video essay is mainly the history of both Thanksgiving itself and Thanksgiving dinner, and nothing else. Thank you so much for watching, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a very long one. As always, hit the like button, share this video, subscribe, and make sure you look out for another poll relating to another potential video essay. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. Have a good day, everybody. Among the Pueblo Island... The Pueblo... <laughs> <laughs> I messed up that line partially early on. <laughs> the river. Oh my god, I flunked it so badly. <laughs> Barbarous. John F. Kennedy. Ah. John F. Kennedy. My tongue is a dick. John F. <laughs>